Welcome, gentlemen, to yet another lore video. This one, I will take a look at the Warriors of Chaos. Now that in the previous video I have explained more or less what Chaos in and of itself is, and why it is, perhaps more importantly, I shan't touch too much upon that. I'll try and stick to the uh, army factions Warriors of Chaos. Now, uh, I will briefly touch upon the Beastmen here and uh, Noska, yet these are not the. Um, these are different factions. The Beastmen are have their very own army book, they're their own faction in every respect, and I will touch upon them in their own episode at a later date. And uh, the Norskins are not an official faction, but they do have a special uh, relationship with the Warriors of Chaos, so I'll be touching upon them. Uh, briefly. So, Warriors of Chaos. They are men, and at some cases beasts, and various other races that have turned to the Chaos Gods in worship. And, um, while worship is not entirely the correct word, it'll do for the moment. The reason why I'm saying it's not quite the right word is that while there is a religious aspect to the worship of the Chaos Gods, being, well, you know, gods after all, the Warriors of Chaos do not worship the Chaos Gods because they're uh, particularly fond of them, so to say. It's not a worship born from respect, from adoration, or any of these things, nor even really fear. And while there are elements of the Warriors of Chaos, like the Norskins, who are brought up in an environment where the Chaos Gods are the primary gods of their religion, and are therefore more or less predestined to become, if not Warriors of Chaos, then at the very least followers of Chaos, many turn to the worship of Chaos out of purely selfish motivations. They do not worship corn because they have a particular affinity with corn. They worship corn because he is the god of warriors, and they are warriors. He is the easiest one, so to say, to follow, because all he really requires is that you go around butchering people, being violent and generally an angry bastard. And if you're a particularly angry bastard, corn might bless you. He might give you magical weapons, magical armor, he might give you mutations, he might give you a magical steed. Although, granted, Korn doesn't really care to give you control over the steed. He, he basically just expects that if you want to ride a juggernaut, you had best be able to subjugate the, the juggernaut by your own powers. Otherwise, well, the juggernaut will have a meal and uh, it'll return happily to the Materium afterwards. Of course, beyond the simple rewards of mundane and magical items is, of course, the promise of power. Not only in our current world, by being a mighty warlord, etc., for example, but also the promise of immortality and powers far beyond that of a mortal man. If the Chaos Gods take a particular liking to a particular champion, they might grant him immortality by making him a Demon Prince. The Demon Prince, being essentially a demigod, has more or less infinite power within the warp. He can create entire worlds to his liking with a mere thought. He could create armies with a mere thought, but in return, he becomes a creature of the warp. He's going to need warp energy to sustain himself, so he's either going to have to be in the Immaterium itself, in the warp, or he's going to have to be relatively close to the Chaos Gates to the north. Although there is, like I mentioned, magics, ways, and means to increase the influence of Chaos upon the world, and thereby giving him greater range of uh, motion, I suppose we could say. And additionally, of course, there are other demon princes in the warp far older and therefore more powerful than a new baked demon prince. And of course, there's the gods themselves. So, while a demon prince in the warp is technically all powerful, he is an all powerful creature surrounded by creatures that are even more powerful, as silly as that sounds. But he has now received his reward. He is a demon prince. 
He is, in all due technicality, immortal. The fact that he's had to give up his human soul to do so, well, he considers that a relatively low price to pay. However, of course, there are very, 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 very few that actually get to the point of becoming a demon prince. The vast majority of Warriors of Chaos are either killed in battle, betrayed by their fellow comrades, or in some other way slain, or they might be driven insane by the mutations heaped upon them as rewards. Their mortal mind might be destroyed simply by the amount of warp energy channeled into them to reward them, but if they absorb too much warp energy, if they uh, stop believing, so to say, because their only real protection is their belief, their belief in their own strength, their belief in their unavoidable destiny to become a demon prince. If they at any point falter in their climb towards that ultimate reward, their mind will break under the warping influence of the warp, and they will devolve into a chaos spawn. A mindless beast in all due effect. This being the chaos god's ultimate punishment for a would-be demon prince is to give him the very immortality he so dreamt of, but none of the powers, none of the intelligence that comes with that immortality. So, with all that in mind, most Chaos Warriors become Chaos Warriors purely from selfish means. They just want to aggrandize themselves. They don't really fight to help Chaos so much as they fight to help themselves. Because while the Chaos Gods are very fickle in their attentions, the Chaos Gods might ignore a loyal champion that has been fighting for their cause and been doing everything he could to try and make them notice him for decades at a time potentially, and completely ignore him. And at the same time, they might reward a human that gave them but the slightest moment of entertainment with the very reward of demonhood that the champion was so seeking. But with that in mind, the Chaos God's eye are usually drawn to acts of great uh, import. And what the various gods consider important vary from god to god, but to give you an example, Korn, the god of warfare, butchery, murder, etc., is far more likely to notice someone who just killed a hundred enemy soldiers in battle than he is likely to notice someone who just killed his first man. So, reason then dictates that if a Chaos Warrior is able to rise to the head of his own Chaos Horde and bring war upon the Empire, for example, killing hundreds of thousands of people, etc, etc, burning down the Empire, doing all kinds of horrible things, logic then dictates that the Chaos God he worships will take notice of him and elevate him to a princedom. Of course, this doesn't necessarily have to be true. Like I just said, the Chaos Gods are extremely fickle, and regardless of how momentous, how gargantuan, how incredible a sacrifice or act you commit in their name, they might just not give a shit. But even then, the promise of immortality, of near infinite power, etc., is a pretty tempting promise, especially for people like the Norskins which are humans, just normal, fleshy humans, nothing particularly strange about them, except they live pretty damn far to the north, they live uh, far to the north of the Empire, they live, uh, they live even further north than Kislev, which means that Chaos has a far greater influence on them than the lands of the south, where its warping influence is less thoroughly felt. So not only do the Norskins already live in a very harsh environment where demons could appear, it's pretty rare even that far north, but demons could technically wander into the land of the Norskins, and them being mere humans, probably going to be butchered in their dozens trying to deal with it. And of course, even the local fauna is affected by the power of chaos getting tougher and nastier and more violent, so even just going hunting in Norska is nothing like going hunting in the southernmost lands of the Empire, for example. A deer might very well be affected by the power of chaos having sharp teeth or a lashing tail, etc. You just really don't know. So, pretty damn harsh place to live, which breed a pretty damn harsh people. 
And as many of the tribes already worship chaos in the guise of local deities, um, for example, the Skraling tribe has a god called the Bloodfather, who is essentially corn by another name. And so they are raised worshipping corn, and people that are raised in this worship might find much to gain by joining the Warriors of Chaos. Especially living as they do in such a harsh and unforgiving land. Not to say that other people couldn't also join Chaos. There are many tales of people from the Empire, for example, traveling north to join up with Chaos Warbands in an attempt at glory and power, wealth and all of the wonderful rewards that such service to the Chaos Gods might offer. But, of course, being raised in an environment where the Chaos Gods are already your primary deities makes it a hell of a lot more likely. That being said, the Norskins are not a Chaos race, they are not directly aligned with Chaos as a force. They're not directly aligned with the Empire either, or any of the uh, quote-unquote good factions of the Warhammer universe. But they're also not evil, they're humans. They have a religious practice that makes them pretty damn savage, but no more so than the, uh, well, <laughs> okay, a little bit more so than the Vikings of our own history, but all in all, they're just a human faction. Not necessarily evil, not necessarily good. And in fact, once a storm of chaos breaks, the Norskans do not flock to join the Warriors of Chaos, they flock south because the Warriors of Chaos recognize only those 100% loyal to their cause and to their gods, and will butcher anyone in that their way that they consider of lesser conviction, including the Norskins. After talking about all of these humans though, it's important to mention that Chaos is not a human factor, it's not something unique to humans. All the races in the Warhammer universe are vulnerable, to varying degrees, to the call of Chaos. There are not only human Chaos Warriors, there are Dwarf Chaos Warriors, there are Elven Chaos Warriors. There are even Vampires sworn to the cause of Chaos. If any race is to be considered immune to the lure of chaos, then it would be the Lizardmen, because the Lizardmen have been specifically engineered by the unknown creators of the universe. I'll touch upon this later in the Lizardmen video, but for all now, all you need to know is that the Lizardmen was essentially engineered to fight against chaos and to keep order and balance in the universe so they are quite unlikely to fall to the Chaos Taint. And another faction that are close to immune to Chaos, but not quite, are the Orcs. The reason why they are immune is not so much because they are immune to the warping or corrupting influence of Chaos, but simply that they don't give a shit. And I know that sounds ridiculous as a reason, but essentially, the orcs are so convinced in their own belief system, in their own ideals, that any uh, mutation given to them by the Chaos Gods, or just as a direct influence as exposure to the warp, is not considered necessarily as a gift from the Chaos Gods. The orc might consider a third arm growing out of his chest as a fascinating novelty granted to him by Gork as a practical joke. And so it requires something quite special for an orc to actually uh, turn to chaos. He needs to actually start believing in the chaos gods rather than this just being his own gods screwing with him. So while they can fall to chaos and there are or chaos warriors, something really unique needs to happen for orcs to convert to chaos en masse. Because in most cases, they'll attribute anything that happens to them simply as their gods doing things, or uh, because they did it of their own volition. Conversely, if any faction could be considered a proper chaos faction, it would be the Beastmen, as they are essentially a product of chaos influence on the Warhammer world. The Beastmen worship chaos out of necessity, it is just part of them. They do not grow up being taught to worship chaos. From their very first breath in this world, they are creatures of chaos. 
And while their ranks also contain many mutants and other minor, not quite, uh, to use a really terrible term in this context, clean beastmen, they do consider themselves to be the proper Chaos faction, and they look upon Chaos Warriors with a bit of a disdain. Like, they do fight for Chaos, but they're not quite as chaosy as of the Beastmen, is what they think. And so, there's no such thing as a Beastmen Warrior of Chaos, simply because Beastmen are Chaos, rather than simply being a convert or a uh, follower of Chaos. Now, I've rambled on for a while about what a Chaos Warrior is, so where are the Chaos Warriors? Well, the Chaos Warriors can be anywhere. They're not uh, constrained to the far north, to the Chaos Wastes, as they are called. By their very nature, Chaos corrupts and influences anyone vulnerable to it, and so Chaos Warriors can just as easily appear in the Empire. Well, not just as easily, but you get my general drift. Uh, in the Empire, in Bretonia, in Ulthuan, etc. Well, actually, that's not true. They can't appear in Ulthuan because of particularly strong magic surrounding the island that shields it from the vast majority of Chaos influence. And they're also going to have a pretty hard time appearing in Lustria, the home of the Lizardmen, simply because there's tons of Lizardmen there. And additionally, while people might very well turn to Chaos while living in another place, a a prominent nobleman in the Empire might very well turn to Slanesh just because he's gotten bored with his everyday life and he wants some more excitement from his life. He would be considered a warrior of chaos. Even though he's not out there actively fighting someone, he is actively pursuing his goals in the name of a chaos power. Additionally, he might of course conduct the journey north thinking perhaps that getting closer to the center of chaos, being the northernmost chaos portals, will increase his chances of being noticed by his chosen deity and thereby being rewarded. Conversely, chaos warriors might travel from the north to the south. The obvious reason for this, of course, is at the head of a war host, or as a member of a war host, out to uh, raid and pillage the lands of the soft southerners. But there might be other, more subtle reasons. A warrior might travel south to start a cult, for example, trying to undermine the lands of the south from inside. He might travel south because a vision told him to. He might travel south just because he's bored. <laughs> He might travel south simply because he reasons that if he stays up north, he's going to have plenty of competition for killing people, and therefore it's going to be harder for him to attract the eyes of the gods. But if he travels south, less chaos warriors, he's going to be a bigger bastard compared to those around him, better chances of killing lots of dudes, better chances of attracting the notice of his chosen deity. And so, Disciples of Chaos, or outright Chaos Warriors, can be found almost anywhere in the Old World. Although, of course, a Chaos Warrior traveling around in the Empire is, of course, very quickly going to find himself the target of considerable efforts to have him brutally murdered, as most nations do not take too kindly to blood-crazed murderers or batshit insane fanatics walking around inside their borders. Especially not as these batshit insane fanatics might just call down the very wrath of the gods they worship on your town. For example, a chosen warrior of Nurgle is going to bring with him all kinds of nasty-ass diseases, and it is in the best interest of pretty much every single nation in, in which he tries to travel to have the bastard impaled upon a lance as quickly as possible. And due to the uh, increasing amounts of hostility garnered the further south they get, most of the Chaos Warriors are uh, hanging around the lands of the Norsken, and fairly far north, the Chaos Wastes, for example. To give you a little bit of an idea of the uh, progression here, so to say, I'll uh, do a little example of you. So, a young Norskin decides one day that he wants something more than just being a member of his village. He's going to leave the village and he's going to go seek his fortune. 
So he gathers up whatever equipment he can get his hands on, weapons, armor, shields, etc, and he travels off into the wilderness. Now at this point he has two choices. He can try to build a legend for himself by uh, himself, by pursuing the goals of his god. For example, Korn, he'll walk around killing people. Nurgle, he'll uh, try and spread contagions, etc, etc. This being by far the hardest route, as a single individual warrior wandering around up there, well, the odds are pretty damn good that he's either going to run into other worshippers of Chaos, who are just going to kill him and steal his shit, he might run into tribes of Norskins, hostile to his own tribe, which will brutally murder him, steal his shit, or he might run into angry local wildlife like trolls, for example, who will, once again, brutally murder him, and while they won't steal his stuff, they are quite likely to just eat it. So, the odds of a single Norskin without a whole lot of chaos power, like in the form of mutations, magical weapons, and armor, etc., is pretty darn unlikely to live for that long. However, of course, if he does manage somehow to stay alive, he's going to be tougher for it. His other option is to go find a nice big Chaos Warband and try to join them. Now, of course, there's always the risk that the Chaos Warband he happens upon first aren't really looking to recruit, and so we return to the brutal murdering and stealing of his stuff. But if they do let him join, okay, he's now within a warband, he has the protection, well, <laughs> protection. Well, let's just say that being in a Chaos Warband still doesn't quite disqualify you from being, well, violently, brutally, and horrifyingly murdered, and having your stuff stolen. At least he's a little bit safer than if he was outside the warband. Additionally, a warband being a, well, warband, usually has some pretty violent stuff planned, which will offer the young warrior the opportunity to not only fight and thereby show his worth to his gods and to his uh, equals, he also has a chance, of course, of getting loot. Which is quite handy, because while inside the Horde, there is very little economy. Uh, the Chaos Hordes do not have a common currency or anything along those lines. Even the Norskin tribes themselves very rarely have a system of hard currency. It's pretty much all based upon trade. And even then, they don't have a proper system of trade. Um, for example, a pound of gold might be worth uh, 10 gold pieces. In one part of Norska, it might be worth 15. In another part of Norska, it might be worth one gold piece in a third part of Norska. And it might be worth precisely nothing in another part of Norska. So when I say he fights for loot, I mean that less in a way that he fights for money or material gain, so much as he fights to gain better equipment. If he sets out from his village with a shield and an axe, and he kills his first opponent in a battle, he takes perhaps his helmet. Now he's got a helmet. Maybe he pilfers a chestplate somewhere, maybe he finds a better axe somewhere, so on. And as he continues to fight, continues to garner loot, he gets stronger, he gets better at fighting, he gets more protection, he gets more weapons, he gets more stuff to play around with, he gets to equip himself to a far higher standard. And if he should be so lucky or so skillful as to kill another Chaos Warrior, a proper Chaos Warrior with the full-on armor and stuff, the Chaos Warrior's equipment will of course be granted to him. Alternatively, of course, he could be granted his equipment from his god. Let's say that our little Norskin manages to do something pretty impressive, like he charges into the enemy horde in front of everyone else and he kills like 20 dudes, and he does really really well, and for some reason Korn takes a notice of this. So he grants our little Norskin a suit of Chaos Armor. Now, Chaos Armor is technically not armor as you would normally think of armor. Proper Chaos Armor is not something you can remove. It is a suit of armor even either gifted to you as a suit of armor, you put it on and it bonds to your body and is far stronger than any normal metal. It might simply be armor that grows out of you. Uh, in the case of Nurgle, for example, it might be that you grow a protective layer of fat, stringy meat across your entire body. 
Or in the case of Zinch, it might not be armor at all, it might just be a pair of robes, for example, that you wear, but somehow these robes that appear to be made of just normal cloth are stronger than steel. It could take essentially any form. But universally, you can assume that Chaos Armor is much, much tougher than normal armor, to the point where killing a Chaos Warrior is pretty damn hard for a normal human. Additionally, Chaos Armor can, as a rule, not be removed once it is put on. It bonds itself to its wearer to the point where the only way of separating a Chaos Warrior from his armor is to kill the Chaos Warrior. At which point the armor will either fall off him, uh, disintegrate into the thin air, or pass to the man who killed him, in the case that the gods deem him worthy of receiving this uh, gift. And so equipped, of course, our little Norskin gets a hell of a lot harder to kill, which allows him to do a hell of a lot better in combat. So, next up he gets awarded with uh, a magical weapon, a demon weapon, for example. He is given a weapon in which the soul of a demon is imprisoned. This, of course, is a ridiculously potent weapon with, again, all kinds of varied powers. A one sword, for example, might be able to steal an opponent's soul just from the slightest scratch. Another weapon might be able to uh, distort time, so that when it cuts an opponent, he instantaneously ages at a massive rate. Or the sword might be a chainsaw. The sword might be uh, envenomed, the sword might be massive, it might be a buster sword, but the warrior can somehow wield it like a normal sword. Again, there are more or less infinite possibilities because the weapon is a chaos weapon. In some cases, when you take a chaos weapon from a chaos warrior that you have slain, the weapon will not remain the same weapon. For example, let's say you kill a warrior of corn, you take his axe. Now, the axe is not your preferred weapon, and so upon taking the axe, the axe changes into a sword, for example. And so, now our Norskin is a proper little badass, equipped and armed with chaos weapons and chaos armor. And so next, maybe his reward will be a mutation. Maybe he'll grow a third arm, for example, so that now he can wield two weapons and a shield. Maybe he will be granted unholy strength. Maybe he will be really, really, really fast. Or it could be a crippling mutation. All mutations granted by the gods are not necessarily beneficial. And in some cases, it's not even the gods themselves. It's just the warping, mutating influence of chaos working upon the subject. For example, the warrior might grow a tail, but it's so fat, massive, and heavy that it hinders his movement. Or the fingers on his hands might grow together and form a club, and so on. Again, essentially limitless possibilities. But let's say he gets something good, he gets like a third arm or something. So now he's a proper, proper badass. And after fighting for a while, he grows his warband, he hardens his warriors, he's now leading a proper band of badasses. So he starts thinking to himself, how can I best garner the attentions of my gods? Well, let's say I worship Korn, for example. The best way of doing that is to go find someone to fight. Now, I could head south, but that means trekking through Kislev and the Empire, etc. Which in all due likelihood means that I'll be facing full-on ranked armies of Kislevitz and Empire, etc. And will in all due likelihood get butchered for very little gain. As while Lord Korn, of course, is plenty happy with just mindless violence, he prefers it that you win. And he prefers it that you win against opponents stronger than you in sheer martial prowess rather than just mere numbers, for example. So, he thinks, the best way to actually garner the favor I seek is to head further north. Because as a general th rule of thumb, most other warbands are going to be thinking the same thing, and so all the nice, big, strong, powerful warbands are going to be heading north, so as to be closer to the Gates of Chaos, and thereby, in their minds, closer to the Chaos Gods themselves, thereby more likely to garner their favor. So, north he heads, and starts fighting more and more powerful warbands. When he defeats a warband by slaying their champion, for example, by killing their leader, 
he absorbs the survivors into his warband and he keeps going north and he keeps going north until either he meets someone bigger, badder and stronger than him that brutally murders him, or he reaches the Chaos Gates. Now even reaching the Chaos Gates is not a guarantee to actually gain the favor of your Chaos Gods. There's a pretty good chance that you'll simply be viciously murdered before you get even halfway there, and even if you do reach the gates, odds are it's simply just going to disgorge a horde of demons onto you that'll feast on your soft fleshy body. But maybe on the way heading north, he will be given the powers he grants. Maybe he will find an enemy champion that's better than him that he will surrender to and fight for him instead. Or maybe he will be given his final reward to become a demon prince. And pretty much the same thing could happen to a noble in the Empire. For example, the Empire noble decides that he really likes killing. He keeps killing, he keeps killing, he keeps killing, he f and by doing so, he starts to worship Korn. Now, eventually he's figured out by the Imperial authorities, he's chased off, and he too figures that, okay, I might as well pursue this. I'm going to head north, and he goes through much the same process as our little Norskin did. And the same could apply to pretty much any other race. Now that I've hopefully explained to you what a Chaos Warrior is and how he comes to be, I'll touch upon how the Warriors of Chaos works as an army. First and foremost, the term army doesn't really fit in the case of uh, Warriors of Chaos. They are more along the lines of um, a warband, of um, a horde, so to say, than the regulated disciplined ranks of an army. Most of the time you have warbands of relatively small size, of perhaps a couple hundred individuals, if that much. Warbands can range from as few as ten to as many as a few thousands. And inside a warband, the structure is very much based on personal strength and personal prestige, with the uh, champion of the particular warband at the head of it, and then several lesser champions leading their own little miniature warbands within the horde. And these warbands can again be of essentially any size. A champion could lead a band of 5 warriors, a band of 20 warriors, a band of 100 warriors. The only real rule of thumb is that the uh, presiding champion's own warband is almost certainly going to be the biggest of the warbands. So if we're thinking a Chaos Army, we're not thinking so much the regimented ranks of a proper Imperial Army, we're thinking more of a large congregation of different warbands working essentially as a smaller warband with the individual warbands led by their own champions. But in this case, the Horde as a whole would be led by a particularly powerful and gifted champion. And to lead a large horde, he really has to be a uniquely powerful individual, because in all due likelihood, the smaller warbands that make up his horde are going to be led by champions that are also really, really good at killing things. And so, if the leading champion for even the slightest of a moment shows any kind of hesitation or weakness, Odds are there's about 50 dudes waiting in line to beat the shit out of him and take his place. And here you thought your work environment was stressful, eh? So with the basic organization of the Horde explained, let's think about the events that could possibly bring about such a Horde. Now, the only real events that could bring about a proper Horde, a massive army of chaos, is a Storm of Chaos, where all of the Chaos Gods unite behind one chosen champion. And this will essentially tell all of the other champions in the entirety of the North and everywhere else to head to this champion. And if they are capable, beat the shit out of him and steal his title, or if not capable, join him and create a massive horde of Chaos Warriors, which will then, in all due likelihood, start rumbling south. As to the composition of such a force, the Warriors of Chaos are almost a pure melee army. They have almost no ranged attacks except for magic, a handful of more or less mercenary artillery pieces, 
and a few units that have some light throwing weapons, a la throwing axes, javelins, that kind of stuff. But they make up for the lack of ranged weapons by being one of the most potent forces in Warhammer World when it comes to melee. Even ogres are going to struggle against Chaos Warriors, because they are not humans by any real means. They are humanoid, they are bipedal, they once were humans, but a Chaos Warrior is far stronger and far better at fighting than most normal humans. And being encased as he is in Chaos Armor, putting one of these bastards in the ground takes some serious legwork. And while the Chaos Army possesses some of the toughest, heaviest, most brutal line infantry in the entire Warhammer universe, they also possess some of the heaviest cavalry in that universe. They also possess some of the biggest, most horrible monsters in that universe. And perhaps their greatest strength in melee combat is their incredibly powerful hero and lord level characters. A Chaos Lord, if properly kitted out, is practically a one-man unit. Most other factions would either have to have some kind of monster or extremely expensive special character to get a character that could be on par with the Chaos Lord, kitted out for mass murder. And of course, the Warriors of Chaos do not consist entirely of ex-human warriors, they can also call upon various demons, although they are not purely made up out of demons, that's another army, Demons of Chaos. They can call upon plenty of demonic allies, and uh, they are not to be sniffed at, at all, when it comes to melee combat. All of this combines into giving you a really brutal brawling force, rather than the sledgehammer of the ogres. The ogres rely on breaking units on the impact. The Warriors of Chaos, while perfectly capable of breaking quite a few units on impact, are better suited to long drawn out melee battles, where their incredibly heavy armor and skill in combat will allow them to wear down the enemy over a relatively short period of time. In addition, while a unit of Chaos Warriors is in melee combat with an enemy unit, they are safe from the enemy's retaliation in the form of ranged weapons, as most races won't fire into combat containing friendly troops, which makes up for their lack of ranged weaponry of their own. So, the big question, how to implement this in a Total War game? Well, you could implement this much like they've implemented hordes in Total War Attila, although... Yeah, it could work, but it'd be really strange. Like, you'd have to have a really massive map for that to really work. Because these hordes would literally have to be running around up north for ages before they could really do all that much, because you'd have to start out with a relatively small faction and then start growing it, etc. Because if you start with a properly developed horde, it's hardcore easy mode. You're just going to start heading south and burning and raising and doing all kinds of nasty things. Furthermore, you have no real motivation to ever settle down. Why, why really would you? This is not a case where you would look for a new uh, home for your people. This is not a horde in Total War Attila terms where you are bringing along the women and the children and the old folks on the baggage train. This is just a band of warriors. The only thing they really care about is garnering as much attention from their gods as possible. And they don't do that by settling down and becoming farmers. One way you could do it is to basically just say that um, there are four competing Chaos Powers in the north. There's Korn, Nurgle, Sinesh, and Zinch, and you essentially have to fight amongst each other to become one proper faction. You subjugate the other factions and you thereby become Chaos Undivided. Now, the term Chaos Undivided requires a little bit more explanation. Chaos Undivided could either be used as a term to describe someone who has not uh, pledged himself to any particular Chaos God. He simply fights for the greater glory of Chaos and will take his blessings from whichever God is looking at the time. In the case of factions, Chaos Undivided as a faction would mean that all of the Chaos Powers have essentially rallied behind one particularly powerful champion that has managed to subjugate the uh, champions of the other four powers, thereby creating the Chaos Undivided faction that could then launch a uh, crusade, to bastardize the term a bit, that heads south. 
a so-called storm of chaos. And this could be one way to do it, although again, it feels a little bit odd, because again, you'll be capturing settlements, you'll be building settlements, stuff like that. Not really a Chaos Warrior thing to do. You could do it. It would kind of work. I wouldn't be too annoyed by it. It's, it's reasonably okay, I suppose. And it would certainly be a challenge, as essentially every single faction you would ever meet hates you. And with good bloody reason, there is no diplomacy within the Hordes of Chaos. You are not going to subjugate Kislev, walk up to the borders of the Empire and go like, Hi, would you like a trade treaty? No, that's just not going to actually happen. So, in my personal opinion, I would prefer it if Chaos was a purely AI-controlled faction. I would prefer it if they weren't even on the map. So that at certain intervals, uh, randomly generated for example, or um, if you let instability run too high, etc, if you um, if you activate certain events, so on, so on, you could unleash a storm of chaos. And when this happens, a bunch of chaos warrior stacks pop up up north and start rumbling south. If you did that right, it could be a really, really cool event. It could be this really big boss battle thing. It'd be kind of like in Medieval 2 when the Timurids or the Huns suddenly appeared with these massive armies and just started laying into you. It's what I kind of hoped the Huns would have been in Attila Total War, but um, they ended up as less of a gale of chaotic force and more like a wet fart in a summer breeze. Though, no, again, that might just be me. Bottom line, I'd much prefer a fully AI controlled opponent that just has a ton of stacks, doesn't have to worry about its economy. All it does is it spawns a bunch of bastards, they head south in this kind of apocalyptic event where you really have to pull together your resources and resist this storm of chaos making it a really apocalyptic event, something to dread, almost, that might require the cooperation of you and your allies to actually withstand it. And of course, you could do a lot of cool things with this. You could work in all manners of cool events, like uh, heroes could appear inside your empire. Say you're playing, for example, the Empire. A storm of chaos has begun. The hordes of chaos are descending on you from the north, so... The Empire unites and stands behind you as their one leader, so you'll get some special units. Maybe a unit of Bright Wizards will offer to join up. Maybe a special hero will show up and offer to lead your armies. Maybe the Colleges of Newland will allow you to uh, borrow more steam tanks. Stuff like that. Could be cool, and in my personal opinion, it would be the best way to implement the Warriors of Chaos, because if you have to give them to a player, if they have to be player controlled, they have to be in some way balanced, which is kind of what happened to the Huns and the Tilla. They had to be balanced. If it's just the AI, you don't have to give a shit about balance. You could let them have as many stacks as possible. You could let them spawn with 12 bloody stacks and just start barreling down upon you. You're a human. You're intelligent. You can probably deal. And that way, it would be a real event. And I think that'd be pretty goddamn awesome. And could be a bit of a solution to the problem we've always had in Total War games, where the end game just gets really, really easy, because once you hit a certain uh, level, you've got like 12 bloody stacks rumbling around the place, there's not really that much that can threaten you. But if 20 bloody stacks of Chaos Warriors appear, well, consider yourself threatened. Well, gentlemen, that has been my little uh, lore and discussion video on the Warriors of Chaos. As always, if you have any questions, leave them in the comment section, where I will take a look at them and I'll respond uh, as fast as I can, really. If you enjoyed the video, please uh, leave a like and subscribe. It's really cool to see that little subscribe ticker keep on growing, so uh, thank you very much for that. I have been Arch, thank you very much for watching, and have a beautiful day.